There we go. How's that? Good morning. I'm so glad you're here this morning, and and uh, and we've we always meet uh, Sunday mornings in this place, uh, not uh, simply fellowship, but we meet in this place because we want to meet God, and uh, and we meet God in a variety of ways, um, and so. Uh, Today we're, we're not only celebrating um, confirmation class, but we're also celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion. So let me just talk about that for a minute. Um, we here at Sunbury United Methodist Church, uh, we believe that what is here is a gift from God. Communion is a gift from God. It's God giving God's son for the world. And, uh, and so, I know some places they, they say, you know, you have to be a member to receive uh, communion. It's not here. This is not our gift to give to you. This is God's gift to you. It's, it's not the United Methodist Church's gift to give to you. It's God's gift to the world. And so if you are here today and you're not a member, uh, please feel free to come and receive this free gift from God. And, uh, and, and uh, the, the youth will be serving this morning. So, again, uh, what a wonderful way to, to experience God's gift in a new and special way. Following the service, uh, we invite you to, to hang around. The, the confirmands will be out in our parlor area. There's a cake out there. And, uh, and so we invite you to stop and, 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 and greet them and say, Congratulations to them. Have a piece of cake. Have two pieces of cake. We believe in the Trinity. You can even have three pieces of cake. The fourth one will get you in trouble. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so, uh, so that's, that's where we're at this morning. We also would like to invite you to stand, if you would, and find someone that you know and say, do I really know you? No. Find somebody that you've not said good morning to. And, uh, and just say good morning. I'm glad that you're here and, uh, and worship well. Can we greet each other in Christian love? You may be seated.
Thank you, Bill Fire. In Christ alone. That was great. Great job. Great job. Thank you, Dean. Church, stand with us this morning for our gathering, which is responsive. And then remain standing as we sing our first song, Open Up the Heavens. With what shall we come before our God? We, we come, come with words and grace. With what shall we come before our God? We come with scattered thoughts and emotions. With what shall we come before our God? We come with hectic schedules and deadlines. With what shall we come before our God? We come with friends and family, with strangers and neighbors. With what shall we come before our God? We come with offerings and ministries, with times and talents. With what shall we come before our God? We come with thankful hearts and yearning souls. With what shall we come before our God? We come with a desire to see justice and to show kindness. Come, my friends, let us walk with our God in humility and love. Let us pray. O oh, Holy One, our worship need not be fancy. Our offerings need not be our lives need not be perfect. We come seeking your blessings. May we seek your present blessing in our lives and the lives around us. Bless us all, O oh God, that we may walk humbly with you, seeking justice and loving kindness every day of our lives. Bless us.
often get to say that. Hey, good morning. My name is Keith Kirkpatrick, and I um, wanted to bring your attention to our paper. Perhaps you already saw the missional budget for this coming year. Uh, just for those of you who are new or maybe didn't know how this works, we work together with all of our administrative functions and our uh, missionary groups within the church to look at what we want to get accomplished in line with our, our vision. And then we put together this budget. And the last couple of years, we've changed kind of the format so that we can think more about a budget in light of how we accomplish our mission. And so you'll see here, when um, we put the budget together, we asked Gordon and his team to look at what we do and how we spend our money as it relates to how we study in the word and prepare ourselves for our mission. And then how we worship the Lord in Thanksgiving. And then more importantly, then how we take all that and reach out to our community. So what's really important in this budget that you don't see here is that if you'll recall last year's budget, which you won't, um, I don't, I don't, and I'm a numbers guy, but the most important part is when you look at the community piece there, last year that accounted for 46% of our budget. So you can see as we continue to focus on our vision of reaching the needs, <clears throat> excuse me, in our community, we are moving more and more of the resources here at the church towards that end. So I think this is really exciting for us. And again, we want to make sure the church family is aware that we've made plans and we're putting that into action and it's all aligned with our mission. All right. The other thing I want to point out is that um, as part of the work to look at where the money goes as far as what, how we accomplish these three areas, um, we do go through and Gordon goes through to look and see where that is. So as we have an exciting group of youth, and I know several of you folks, they're already in the mission field with us during the summer. Um, there is outside the office a list of all of the areas of worship, all the areas of study, and all the areas of community outreach. So as these young people are going to come up and make their confession and join us and make our church family new and bigger and different, um, it's a great and exciting time for each of us to kind of reflect and kind of recommit ourselves. And if you're thinking, man, how can I plug in? Um, that information is available. So there's ways to plug into the community. If you're looking for Bible study, if you're looking for where can I plug into worship, all those items are listed out there. I invite you to go out there and take a look at it. All right. So with that, I'd like to call our ushers forward um, for our offering. Blessed are the givers of these offerings, givers of peace and justice, givers of love and compassion, givers of kindness and mercy. Blessed are we who are entrusted by God to share God's gift with the world. Thank you, Keith. We're grateful you're at Numbers Meeting. All right, if you would please stand with us for our New Testament scripture reading. It's from Acts 9. Verses 18 through 31. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, 
and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished, and they asked it, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gate in order to kill him, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord. And that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, (laughs) but they tried to kill him off. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. Aren't those wonderful words of life? Would you sing that hymn with me, Tim? You know, I've been wondering, and I've never had it happen, but maybe today could be the first, and you could be a part of something exciting. That he's standing for the entire sermon. How would that sound? <laughs> you may be seated. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I hear a collective sigh of relief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're, we're halfway, today is halfway through a series on uh, Barnabas, who uh, is not well known in the Bible, but he is an important character. And what we're looking at in the life of Barnabas is how he was a leader in the church. And what does it look like to be a leader? Not only in the church, but in the world. I think you would agree with me that there are great and powerful means by which we can shape lives in the world, and it comes in the form of ideas. It comes in the form of ideas. That's where, that's where great leaders start. I think you could probably remember this phrase, ask not what your country can do for you. Do you remember that phrase? Yeah. It started with an idea of sending an individual to the moon and bringing them back within a decade. This is a great idea. And you know what? That one idea shaped so many lives. And we could stop there, but... I don't know whether we realize it or not, but there's even something more powerful than an individual who has an idea. That's a person who embodies that idea. That, that idea lives in them. John Kennedy, President Kennedy's idea had power, not only because they listened to the idea, but they also looked to the president, the man, who was sharing that idea. I try to connect it to our faith, and, and you know what? We can have great doctrines. And, and there are powerful means. Those, those things that we say, you know, that, that we will do this, and we will do that, and we will... They're great ideas for shaping lives but even more powerful than just those doctrines is if those doctrines are lived out by a real person. This, this means that, that what we find in our Bibles that say this is a Christian life are important, but what's more important, and that's what we've been talking about the last two weeks, is the person. The person that lived and died and kept true to the doctrine, that's, that's, the powerful, that's the powerful part. In fact, it's, we talked about the stories last, last week. And, and, and we look back at those stories, but can I tell you that some of those stories are current and they're part of our lives even now? I received a letter when Catherine and I were pastoring in a previous parish. I received a letter from a man that I had never met. He lived in Elyria, Ohio, up near the coast. And, and in that letter, the man told me a little bit about himself. And, and in that letter... It wasn't the words in the letter, but it was what that man was living that became a powerful inspiration to me. Let, let me just, I, I, I jotted down the words. I, I put them in the computer because I, I know I would lose the letter. So listen to what he, said, what he wrote. He said, I have a maintenance business. And I found that in the manual labor I perform, there is time that my mind is free to meditate on God's word. And I have found myself enjoying the glories and beauties of God in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the process, he writes, in the process, I have memorized 
15 books of the New Testament. And I have found the scripture to be increasingly sweet and real and precious as God's Spirit takes them and makes the things of Christ real to me. It wasn't the words in the letter that inspired me. It's the words being lived out in their lives. Oh, it's one thing to know the biblical teachings. It's another thing to hide in our heart. It's another thing, and even better, to let it live in our lives. I, I began to think right then and there, if, 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 if someone can memorize 15 books of the Bible, do you think I can memorize one verse? In fact, as we've started this study and looking at the life of Barnabas, I've I've taken us to the book of Hebrews. It's, It's rich and it's alive because it continues to remind us that it's our lives living out our faith that really counts. The author of Hebrews in the 13th chapter says, consider the outcome of a person's life and then imitate their faith. Listen and look at how a person lives, what they're talking about. When they talk to you, look at their life and see if it's matching up. And if it does, then imitate their faith. That's what a leader is. Oh, I forgot to give you the definition of what a Christian leader is, right? Or do you already know it? Let me give you the broad definition. Broadly speaking, a a Christian leader is a person who is more or less a Christian and a leader. There, you've got it, right? Uh, And that person exerts more or less Christian influence in a Christian way. It's got to be done right. Or let me put it another way, to the degree that you are able to shape others toward the image of Christ, then you become a Christian leader. You don't have to hold an office, my friend. In fact, it's preferable not to hold an office. A Christian leader is one who helps someone else mature in their faith. To have that personal strength to to draw others into the sway of the influence of our lives, which should be reflecting Christ, to lead them in the ways of Christ. I, I, I ran across the words of a man by the name of Patrick Johnson, and, and he, uh, he wrote a, a, a book, Operation World. What he says is spot on. Let me quote what he said. And there is a worldwide lack of people, men and women, truly called of God and deeply taught in the scriptures to lead others to Christ. People willing to suffer, scorn, poverty, and the shame of the cross for the sake of the Savior. There he goes. If I had more time, I'd, I'd like to, to turn around and explore this more, but that could be another sermon. But I think John Stone's uh, diagnosis is right because it's biblical. What the church needs are spirit-filled, Bible-saturated, Christ-exalting, humble, untiring, preserving leaders who exert a a deep, broad, life-changing influence of Jesus Christ in the lives of others. Isn't that what... The world needs? I don't think I need to repeat it. Now, if you want to know that definition, you look at the life of Barnabas. He hits every one of those. I think uh, what's being said is we need hundreds and thousands of Barnabas-like leaders. And I'm I'm not talking about, about leaders today. Because Barnabas is a leader, but he's more than that. 
If you can capture anything today, capture this. I'm not talking about leaders today. I'm talking about leader makers. Last week we talked about what it means to be a leader, but today we're talking about being a leader maker, someone whose influence draws someone else into a leadership role. I guess I asked the question, are you one of those people? Or maybe I should ask it in a different form. Could you be one of those people that your life of Christ, the influence that you have to, to help others, could you draw them into Christ so that they become someone who draws others to Christ? But don't rule yourself out too quickly. But I do have to ask, do you understand the difference in being a Christian leader and being a Christian leader maker? I don't know if you know of Charles Spurgeon. He was one of the greatest preachers of the 19th century. He ran across someone in his life. He was a great Christian leader. But he ran across someone in his life who was a leader maker to him. Oh, it happens to be, uh, <laughs> happens to be a, a, a lady by the name of Mary King, a housekeeper at the school he attended as a teenager. Listen to his words. These are the words that Charles Spurgeon penned. She liked something very sweet indeed. A good, strong Calvinistic doctrine, but she lived strongly as well as fed strongly. And many times we have gone over the covenant of grace together and talked of the personal election of the saints, their union to Christ, their final perseverance, and the vital godliness that is required and I do believe that I learned more from her than I could have learned from any six doctors of divinity of the sort that we have none today he says the most important thing you may ever do for the cause of Christ may go unnoticed for 30 years but don't quench God's calling for you to be a leader maker. So I asked the question, what's a leader maker? What are the characteristics? Barnabas's life does show that. So I, I, I want to, to quickly, I want to quickly touch on just a few of them. You see, Barnabas took Paul under his wings and encouraged him to be a leader in the church. He formed two leaders that are well known. Barnabas, as far as we know, wrote no books in the New Testament that are there. And yet the two people that he took under his arm and developed into being Christian leaders, they wrote a third of the New Testament. Paul wrote 13 of the epistles of the New Testament, and Mark wrote one of our four Gospels. So what does it take to be a leader maker? First, you have to be an individual that's willing to take a risk. You have to look at someone and say, I'm going for it. I'm going to give them the chance. In fact, uh, that happened to the Apostle Paul. Part of our, our text says that everyone was afraid of, of Paul. Last part of uh, verse 26. They were all afraid of him, and, and they didn't believe that Paul had actually become a disciple. And guess what? No one's willing to take a risk to embrace this man who had been transformed by an encounter with Jesus Christ, except for one person. 
one man would stick his neck out for every, for, for, for one man would stick his neck out for the person everyone else was afraid of. 27, Barnabas took him in and brought him to the apostles and became an advocate for him. That's the first mark. Are, are you and I willing to take a risk of, with someone that no one else sees what God can possibly do in their life? I guess that leads me to the second. That's having a, a good eye and a glad heart. Looking at, for the embers of grace, as we talked about last week. The embers of grace in someone's life, and then, and then slowly fanning it. I, I, I believe this, that, that true leader makers have a heat sensor that, that's adjusted to look and see with those that they meet, is there an ember of God's grace working in their lives? Can it be fanned in such a way that it comes alive and, and into a, a roaring fire? But let me tell you, that takes someone who is humble. Biblical leader makers are humble people. That means that, that they don't have to be in the front. They, they would just as soon get that ember going and step back and not be in the forefront and allow God's grace to work through the lives of someone else. They're not addicted to the praise of other people. They don't crave to be in the limelight. In fact, if you were to follow the life of, of Barnabas and, and, and Saul and Paul, you'll find that, that Paul begins to increase in and, and at the beginning of their relationship, Barnabas' name is always mentioned first. And as, the, as, as Barnabas steps back, as Paul embraces this grace that he's discovered, the names switch. Barnabas fades into the shadows and Paul steps forward. You'll find this beginning in the 13th chapter. You'll find this that, that, that Paul begins to, to, to embrace that mission of, of gathering others into his sphere of influence so that they might experience God's grace. And Barnabas steps back and lets God's grace work. That's the role of a... Of a, of a biblical leader maker. We don't have to always do it. The message I've been preaching here at SUMC among our committees is start a ministry, let it grow, and step back and let someone else take that and make it grow. You don't have to be a part of it. If the grace of God is working and we are making leaders, not maintaining leaders, there's a big difference. But that means that we have to be patient with the failure of others. And Barnabas truly was. In fact, we're going to talk more about that next week. And lastly, a biblical leader maker is free from the desire of materialism. They, they we're not in love with money. But rather, we're in love with people. In fact, in the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, Luke records that, that the apostles gave Barnabas, the name of Joseph, Barnabas his name because it means that it's a son of encouragement. That's what his name means. He sold the field and gave the proceeds so that the kingdom of God might grow. So if you want to be a leader, you really have to be a leader maker. If you want God to work, you really have to be a leader maker. That's what God has in mind. And what do leader makers lay awake at night and think of? 
their minds turn to how can I help other people step forward. Dream about how to maximize what God has given us to help other people for the sake of God's kingdom. That's why I share the pulpit so often with others. We do sermons together. It's to, it's to help develop. That's why I walk alongside of our church leaders and encourage them. It's for a season. You should be developing others to step into those leadership roles. Not that you step out of leadership, but you look for other ways to enhance the kingdom of God. And how does that happen? Let me just recap it for you. You have to be willing to take a risk and to support maybe something that looks dangerous to other people. You have to have a good eye and a glad heart for, for finding the grace of God in the lives of people. You have to be humble. It's not about you. It's not about me. We have to fade out of the front. We're not the rising star of the, of the show. We have to be patient with the failures of others. And we have to not look at the material side of things, but we have to look at the people side of things. So I have one prayer for our confirmands and for this church. May the Lord fill this place with leader makers so that the cause of Christ may grow in this place. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, here's a chance for you to step into that starting point of leadership role, and here's our chance to be looking for ways in which we can fan the embers of grace in those that will be baptized and confirmed and received into membership. I invite you to come forward at this time. Those that desire to be baptized and, and confirmed into the faith and unite with us. I just want to remind us that that we've all been received into the church through the sacrament of baptism and we've found nurture and support in the midst of the family of God. And it's through prayer and study that we are actually led by God's spirit to claim our covenantal relationship with Jesus Christ and with the members of this church. Would you join me in the response? The Apostle Paul, let's go to the next slide, please. Next slide. The Apostle Paul reminded the church at Ephesus, writing, Be alert all your traitors and failures, that you are citizens with the saints, and also alert those who are far off, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. All right, Morgan Evans, Charles Randalls, Tyler, Broden, and Logan. I have some questions for you, and if you'll respond um, appropriately. First, do you renounce the evil powers of this world and turn to Jesus Christ as your Savior? If so, will you respond by saying, I do? And do you put your trust in his grace and love and promise to obey him as your Lord? If so, will you answer, I do? Do you believe in God? the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, in Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life? If so, will you answer, I do. Do you accept the word of God as guide and authority for your life? If so, will you answer, I do. Are you willing to give and receive counsel in the congregation? If so, will you answer, I am. Now, do you know what that means? Now, let me just share that a little bit. To give and receive counsel, that means to 
share your wisdom with others, since you have some wisdom, whether you know it or not, or what, that you say, hey, I think that this might be able to work this way. And then also be willing to listen to others. It's being part of the family is what it is. Are you ready to participate in the mission of the church to make and mature disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, which includes your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, will you respond by saying, I am? I am. Okay, Morgan and Evan, I believe that you like to be baptized if you'd come forward at this time you stand right here that's good and i'll try and not get in your way okay on your confession of faith in jesus christ i baptize you with water in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit may god baptize you with the holy spirit from above May your spirit, your soul, and your body be kept sound and blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and will do it. And if you don't want water running down your nose, you can use this. You're good? All right. I did it right. All right, Charles, Randall, Tyler, Broden, and Logan, will you join us, please, around this right here, around the baptismal font. Just come right around there. There you go. All right, let's turn around so everybody can see you as well. There you go. All right. On your confession of faith in Jesus Christ and the reaffirmation of your baptismal vows, we encourage you to use your gifts to further God's kingdom here on earth. And may the Holy Spirit work within you that being born of water, through water and spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And so what I ask is for you to come and to remember your baptism and, and uh, to come and touch the water and then to go and touch the world. So if you'll do that, please. You should come and just put your hand in the water there. There you go. And come and touch the water and then remember that you're to go and into the world and touch the world. All right, let us pray. Our powerful God, Grant Morgan, Evan Charles, Randall, Tyler, Broden, and Logan, the fullness of your Holy Spirit, a clean heart, a right spirit, and the joy of salvation. Make them one in whom Christ is seen to be alive again. Release the gifts you gave them in creation and redeem them in Christ. And may the God of peace sanctify all of you wholly. Will the congregation please sing? And repeat. Responsive, it's a congregation information and it's responsive. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of the Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary? believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament? We do. Do you promise, according to the grace given to you, to keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in the same all the days of your life as faithful members of Christ's holy church. Brothers and sisters, I commend to your love and care these persons whom this day we receive into membership of this congregation. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love.
Let us pray. Oh God, we praise you for calling us to faith and gathering us into the church, the body of Christ. We thank you for your people who have gathered this local church and rejoice that you have increased your community of faith. Together may we work in spirit, building one another up in love, sharing in the life of worship of the church and the serving of the Lord Jesus, of Jesus Christ. Amen. Also, if 
you are concerned about uh, uh, COVID and so on, we do have toothpicks uh, for you to, to uh, pick up the bread if you like, and also we have self-contained communion sets that are there uh, for you to take and open if you so like. Here we have a practice that the communion rail is always open. It gives anyone a chance to kneel, stand, sit, and, and just talk with God, whatever you want to say. It's your time. No one will come behind you. No one will, will want to know what you're talking. It's your personal, private time with God. I encourage you to take advantage of that. Would you join me in our liturgy of, of the great thanksgiving? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to your almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, bringer of justice and righteousness. In ancient days, you created us in your image and invited us to be reflections of your presence in the world. When we fell short and wandered far from your path of justice and love, you held our hands and walked with us in humility and compassion. You called us to be your people and invited us to walk humbly beside you. And even when we turned away, you continued to walk with us, calling us back to your path of justice and love through the proclamation of your law, the words of your prophet, and the wisdom of your poets and storytellers. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to reveal your gracious presence in the world and to invite us onto the journey anew. You anoint us with your blessing and trust and call us to bless your world with the love and compassion, justice, and truth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, saying, Holy, 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 Holy Lord God, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. With joy and gratitude, we, we break this bread and remember the many times when Jesus blessed his disciples in the breaking of the bread. In remembrance, we will take and eat this bread and reflect on your blessed presence, which fills our souls and leaves us satisfied. With joy and gratitude, we fill this cup and remember the many times when Jesus poured out his love and compassion. In remembrance, we will drink from this cup and reflect on your blessed presence, which overflows in our lives and invites us to bless others as we are blessed. And so, in remembrance of these two mighty acts of love and grace, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as humble servants, walking with you in justice and compassion as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ has come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on our fellowship, that we may be blessed with your love and your grace. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine that they may nourish us with your wisdom and with your truth. Guide us in your spirit that we may walk humbly by your side. Make us one with Christ in compassion and mercy, one with each other in justice and kindness, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your heavenly banquet. Through Jesus Christ and with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, both now and forevermore. Amen.
The only reason that we can celebrate this morning like we have is because of the goodness of God. Would you stand and let's sing a song about God's goodness.
we go with the foolish grace of God. That's it, Eric? Got, uh, oh, no, okay. I thought there might be more. Okay. Um, listen, we got one more song. I, we have a story to tell to the nation. And, and uh, while this song is going, our confirmands and sponsors, if you'll head out so that you'll be out by the cake. And, <laughs> and, and just a quick quiz. How many pieces of cake? One? Three is the max. Two? Three. There you go. And if I understand correctly, each of us only have two hands. That means you're going to have to find a friend that will help you with that third piece. All right. If you'll uh, exit and let's, we've got a story to tell to the nation. <laughs> a music director in you my friend <laughs> now go in the grace and peace of our lord jesus christ and be leader makers go in peace amen